He's a cross between Joe Rogan and Joel Olstein. Welcome to Excellence in Policing with Andy Harvey. And welcome to the show. Let me ask you something. Have you ever wondered, do the police really prevent crime? Or, or, or let me put it like this. Should the police be blamed or should they take all of the credit for crime in their cities? That's what we're going to talk about today. And I'm really excited about it because we have a great panel uh, in the room today. Academia, we have media, we have uh, practitioners. So I think we're going to have some great discussion around crime. And, and I really want to dig into this because it, it's in every city. We talk about is crime up? Is it down? What's causing it? And there's so many factors. And, and I feel like there's just it's not as simple as people think. And so, so let me introduce our, our panel today. Let me start with Tanya Iser from WFAA in Dallas. I've known you, Tanya, for a while, and Tanya has a lot of experience covering Dallas PD, and really policing, not just Dallas mm -hmm. PD. And, and I wanted you here because uh, I, I want your perspective from kind of the outside looking in, and, and, and I want to know, you know you, the way your perspective on things and I, I think you're gonna add a lot of value and then we have academia here D dr alex becaro from the university of texas at dallas he's a criminologist there by the way you're probably the coolest looking criminologist <laughs> I, I i've met thank you so uh, <laughs> so so thanks for being here he's also on the dallas mayor's task force on crime because uh, that, that's a big deal here in in our city but uh, not only here it's across the country and then a friend of mine chief dan carolla he's the chief of police in lake dallas texas uh, but also was a commander in the Dallas Police Department. And so uh, we have a pretty good panel here, I'm telling you. And so I'm excited to, to talk about this with you. So I'm going to jump right in. Do the police prevent crime? Dr. Picaro, what do you think? Uh, they can prevent some crimes, but not a lot of crime. And so, for example, if you take the crime of homicide, uh, homicides are, more often than not are ag assaults going bad, drug deals going bad, or gang turf wars gone bad. The police can't do much about those situational events. Uh, they can prevent some crimes in some instances, um, and it depends on how the police are used and how much proactive uh, ability they're given by their command staff and how much they are able to use the data uh, to make better decisions while on the street. But we have to be very measured about uh, the bar at which we hold them accountable to because they can't be everywhere at all times dealing with every single possible crime type. There's way too many calls for service and way too much square footage uh, area-wise in the city of Dallas, Philadelphia, any other big city uh, for that matter. So we have to be very measured about what we expect them to do given the resources they have. You know, and that's one of the things as as a chief of police and, and, and I've you know we've heard this from other chiefs of police uh so so should we you know just what you said should we be being should we be blamed for the crime that happens in our cities totally uh because it seems like we have failed to manage expectations at some level and, and because of that throughout the years because listen let's face it the last quarter century crime has been good business for us because it's been going down nationally so for us to say hey look what we're doing crime is down let's celebrate it that's fine, but what happens when crime starts increasing? Do we change our narrative, right? So now we take all the credit, but now who takes the blame, right? So I'm not sure it's a fair game, but have we failed to manage expectations, Tanya? Yes, but <laughs> um, I, I mean, certainly police do not take all the blame and they, don't, they shouldn't take all the credit, but I, in this, I'm gonna speak from my experience of covering policing since 1996. And, and then specifically from you know, 2003, 2004, when Chief Kunkel came in and took over the Dallas Police Department, we saw a lot at that time frame of what was happening in Dallas. Dallas's murder numbers was, was high. There was, a, just, there was a sense in the city that things were out of control, much like it feels right now. And Chief Kunkel, he came in and he worked with the community. I mean, I remember him going to all kinds of community meetings. I mean, it, it was kind of crazy that just, he was very plugged into the community. But he had a mantra, gangs, guns, and drugs. And so I would agree with Dr. Pacero to a, to a degree, but if you have a department that is effectively fighting gangs, guns, and drugs, I do believe they make an effect. And over the, since the police department staffing has gone from 3,000, uh, 3,700 in 2010, roughly, down to back, down to around 3,000, I, I think we're kind of paying the piper. And when you lost, 
that tremendous amount of experience that walked out of the door with the pension crisis. So not only do you have a smaller police force again, you have a less experienced police force, you have decimated your, um, your, your narcotics divisions, your gang unit is just now starting to rebuild, um, your crime response teams that were very effective have been decimated as well as your deployment squads. And I, I mean, I, yeah, I do think police can impact crime and I don't, but I don't think they should get all the blame and I don't think they should right. get all the credit either. Yeah. And, and, but, but, you know, when you talk about managing expectations, um, have we been real with the public? And in, in other words, have the police been, and I'm talking general here. Okay. Have the police been real with the public? Have we been totally forthcoming on what our capabilities are? Right. Uh, and that's a hard conversation to have. Have we done that? And have we placed ourselves in a position where we're like, OK, now that crime's going up. Now what? And, and so that's my thing. And, and, and I'm not I'm not so sure we've done a great job. What do you think, Chief? So I think, <clears throat> excuse me, I think the uh, manner in which we police the community is equally as important as how we manage our expectations. Okay, and I think that's one of the things that we need to get out there and, and show that we have value in other areas. And one of the things that I've been critical about by some of the index cities is they live and they die by the crime percentage sword. Okay, so for your average citizen, uh, you take some of the other cities, you take San Francisco right now or Seattle that are having um, a lot of issues with blight and, and social unrest. Uh, I don't think your average citizen cares that car burglaries are down 4% this month. Okay, I think what they care about is how do they feel about going to the grocery store? Are they being panhandled? Okay, are they, are they looking at blight? Or do they feel like they're gonna be a crime victim? And so you take, uh, and, and Dallas PD is a great example. Okay, 13 years of, of consecutive crime reduction. Mm, all right, that's fine, but that's one basket. Okay, but what about the other baskets? What, what, what do we do to manage with the community about uh, the tactics that we use, about the way that we interact with the community, about the things that we value and the way that we deliver service. Do we allow input? Are we going to be a command and control agency? Are we going to be a community policing agency? Are we going to do like what Chief Kunkel did and let the community have a prominent seat at the table and decide for themselves how they're going to be policed? So, so you know, proactive police, and you were talking about, Tanya, is an integral part of this, right? Uh, we need to do more of that in order to combat crime. But is, is there, can we go too far with proactive policing to the point where we actually drive a wedge between us and the community? We're talking about trust and confidence and all those things that are important. Can we go too far? And, and, and at what point do we... Uh, say okay uh, this is all this is all we can do when it comes to policing uh, because again right back to expectations uh, can we go too far dr picaro i think that the police and the community need each other and you can't you can't uh, do uh, the job of, of uh, crime fighting or developing informal social control or trust and confidence in the community and your neighbors and the police without uh, both people at the table working one another with one another um, I think that uh, police also need to remind people that they can't solve the problems of in, uh, failing schools, lack of meaningful jobs, impoverished, uh, impoverished communities. A lot of the things that contribute uh, to some of the underlying structural problems that uh, lead individuals down a pathway of crime. Uh, and the community can't also expect the police to solve those problems. And so you need people to understand what each of them are responsible for and to work together because each party wants the exact same outcome and as long as they have that in mind and and have a trusting and working relationship with one another they can be disagreements about how you might do this or how you might do that or where you want to put your emphasis on um, but there's more to be gained by people working together and i think the analogy of 11 players on a football field is a good example you may not like your teammates but for that pass to go 45 yards down the field and land perfectly in a receiver's hand, everybody has to do their job because they all want the same outcome. I think that that's the way policing should be in the 21st century. And, and, and we are just one player on that team. See, that, that's where I think we can get it wrong, where we think we are the entire team. And, and I think we need, need to do a better job of saying just what you said, uh, Dr. B. Carroll. Just listen, we are a part of that.
And, and when we work together, then we can move that ball down the field with no problem. Or, uh, well, I shouldn't say no problem, a lot easier. Uh, because crime is a difficult thing. And uh, again, right, I, I feel like sometimes we've placed ourselves in, in a bad spot. Uh, because of some of the rhetoric and, and I think we haven't been as forthcoming and we've probably taken too much credit to be honest with you This is just me talking uh, for, for a lot of these crime declines And uh, I'm not sure it was the, the best thing to do because now we're in a position where again, we have to change that uh, So what does that mean because crime is up our strategies aren't working now? They were two years ago. What happened now, right? And so I think we need to be careful when it comes to managing that. And I think we are, but I do think it's just something to be consider, uh, to considerate of when we're talking about crime. Well, Dr. Picara is exactly right. And, and in community meetings, I bring these up all the time, the exact same things you just said, that we don't control poverty. Uh, we don't control public funding for uh, access to mental health services. Um, we, can, we can combat drug trafficking and we can work on street level narcotics complaints, but the police department does not control addiction. Oh. Uh, access to uh, food, access to education, access to medical care. These are all the things that we don't control that do send people down that pathway sometimes. I completely agree with you. Yeah, so uh, it's, it's complex. It's not easy. It's not one, you know, so again, right, it's not just us doing fighting crime and people look at us for all the answers. And, and I think we're changing that. So the, the, the conversation now is more of what you're talking about, Chief. It's talking about all those addictions and mental health and all those things that we have to deal with. Uh, but society has placed a lot of those responsibilities on us. Mm -hmm. And fair or unfair, they have. And, and uh, we can't make an impact on all of those things alone. Uh, back to what you were saying, Dr. B. Carroll, we have to work together and we have to work with our social service agencies. We have to work with our nonprofits, our whatever. And so, uh, so that's really, I think, where, where we need to be. And again, going back to crime, um, it's not as simple as people think. They, they really believe that. I say they, I'm, I'm being, I'm generalizing here, but a lot of people believe that it's it's a simple thing. It really is, and, and it's very complex. And I think an important part of this is transparency or as much transparency as possible. Obviously there are some things that have to be held back from the public at certain periods of time when you're doing some kinds of covert investigations or whatever it is. But the more information that you can share to people and say, okay, this is what we're gonna, what we're doing. This is why we're doing it. And you may not have the answer in five minutes. Sometimes things take days to play out. Right. Uh, but we will be as transparent as possible. And I think that that's where the the checks that uh, external agencies like the media do on the pub, uh, on on the police department is a really good example of that. Right. Well, and, and crime look, crime is cyclical. That which goes down eventually is going to go back up. Um, but we'll never really know in Dallas what would have happened if the staffing and the manpower, and if that had stayed at the same levels as it was. I, I, I think it's, you know, chances are crime would have ticked back up, but I do think that your murder numbers is a decent indicator of the level of violence in a city because most of your murders are going to be based around um, drugs and gangs. And it gives a sense of what's going on. And there is another problem out there, which is this, this whole anti-snitching issue. There's a lot of crimes that could be solved if people would just come forward. Why don't they come forward, though? Chief? Well, I think there's a lot of reasons that folks don't come forward. I think number one would just be fear of retaliation. And at the end of the day, um, I think fear is a powerful motivator for people to do things or to not do things. Yeah. And Go ahead. Yeah, well, I interviewed a, a, a person recently when I was doing a, the yearly crime stat story on, on the homicide numbers, and uh, one of the people I interviewed was very reluctant to talk on camera because of that, for that exact reason, uh, because they feared that even talking on camera, that mm -hmm. somebody might come retaliate against them. It's so a that, real is a, that is a thing, real yeah. present problem. There are many cases where uh, detectives, they know who did it, but or they suspect you did it, but people won't come forward. Yeah. It's, e it's easy for us to sit back and say, well, just tell people what the end, you know, just tell the police what you know. Uh, but you know, if in their world, in their experiences, they may be hurt, a family member may be hurt. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not trying to give someone a free pass on this, but you have to understand that that, that, that is understandable from their point of view, but it also has the um, negative side effect that you, you don't build that community trust. You need the, pol the, the community to police itself. There you go. And that is critical. It's the, the bedrock of uh, informal social control that leads to 
neighbors watching neighbors. And when that erodes, um, then the police can't go in there and start getting the intelligence they need at the local level to gather individuals, gather suspects, and do their job. What if we change that dynamic, right? So what if we change it to where the community takes ownership of their community <laughs> and we are there as a support to support them in their efforts? What if we did that? And is that, is that reasonable? It is reasonable and it works. Um, if you go back to Dallas PD, probably around mm, 2014, go study your Lake West storefront. We had a leadership change out there and we put a, a sergeant out there with a lot of vision. His name was Gerald Ronalds. He's retired now. And um, under his tenure, I don't believe we had a murder in West Dallas. He had 10 officers in a storefront. Well, and that just tells you how critical leadership is. Yeah. You, you know, the, the ability to command, the ability to have your rank and file officers respect you, respect your decisions. And that is, I saw, I've seen that over and over in my career, how important that is. You know, it's like, uh, you want to follow that guy up the hill. You know, right, I'll give right, Charlie right, Cato right, as an example. Right. There's a lot of officers yeah. that will follow right. Charlie Cato he's, up that yeah. hill. He's, he's got a lot of influence. He's a good leader. Yeah, so it's not just about the number of officers. It's, it's like what you were talking about before the show, Dr. Picaro, is it's how you use them and how you lead them, right? Absolutely. The, yeah. the, the tone is set from the boss, yeah. and that's true in academia. That's true in, in the media world. That's true in a sports team. Uh, if you if you start with the idea of inclusivity and it's transparency and this is what we're going to do this is why we're going to do it I'm going to bring some people together to bounce ideas off of you, you know everybody again everybody has to work together in, in, in a large police agency of 3,000 people um, you know obviously the, the chief can't talk to every single person get every right. single person's opinion but you have to have your your people below you your staff go to do that work and bring everybody to the table and say okay we are a team here it's not a boss telling people what to do it's we're going to bring this stuff together and we're going to plow ahead as a unit. So, so I like to call it quality driven policing. Uh, you, you know, I, I do think we've come from a place where we were numbers driven and that's not necessarily a bad thing in itself. But if we're only chasing numbers, um, you, you know, you have to look at the type of numbers that you're getting for a long time. Comstat and I, I think a lot of agencies still do that today. Uh, th so that was big in the 1990s, right? When that came up and, and people were taking, uh, 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 there were actually, it was more accountability for police leaders to know what the heck was going on in their districts. And, and so, so I, I do believe part of that though, uh, that we became solely a numbers driven uh, in pol policing. And I think what that did was also mismanage expectations. And it also drove a wedge in some communities that were already feeling neglected. And so here's the question at what what's the cost right of of driving down crime if it's purely numbers driven at what cost can we you know is is there too much well i think you run the risk of doing things that are both unlawful and illegitimate in your community when you start just being numbers based okay so, so cop stat was a good idea in the 90s because it started in New York City, right? And, and we had uh, station house commanders who, who essentially fell asleep at the switch. And CompStat was the ultimate accountability measure. And, and a lot of it was based on uh, social control. And it was formal social control. Uh, a lot of it was through embarrassment. A lot of people retired or reassigned under CompStat. And that's fine, it, it did its job. But when you get to the place that you have a new generation of police leadership that have been held accountable, that tactic's not gonna work right. and it has to evolve. So when you continue to push this narrative of we gotta drop these numbers at all costs and we're gonna do whatever it takes to, to lower it one tick on the scale, then you can go in the community and you can be seen as an occupying army as opposed to helpers. Well, That's a great point, Chief. We just lived through that in New York City with stop and frisk. I mean, it's the exact same mm -hmm. thing that happened. Well, and probably the thing that I tangled the most with um, Chief Kunkel was over crime numbers you know this Andy. yes, uh, yes. because the department made huge changes in how they counted certain crimes in the aggravated assault category there were a lot of uh ag assaults like if you got hit with a baseball bat 
Right. And in the past would have been counted as a, an ag assault, but a lot of times was then being counted as a simple assault. And right. then you had a lot of games that were played. I would call them games. Maybe they wouldn't call them games. In your burglary numbers, some stuff that would have been a burglary before it was being called criminal chest trespass. You had um, an auto theft category. You had there was a lot of a lot of changes that were made, and so the police department wanted to take all the credit for the reductions, right? Rather than just saying, you know, some of this is real, mm -hmm. but some of this is paper reductions. Yeah. And I remember, you know, many discussions. <laughs> I was there. I remember. You remember? <laughs> were you the Were you the PIO yes, when all I that was, was going I on? Sure I mean, there was, sure the, it was some very intense discussions yeah. that. And, and, I, and my argument was, do you guys really want to take the credit for all this? Because at some point, it, you know, because there was some there were some real changes that were made in the way things were counted. But, but what was happening was the and, investigation and, of remember and, that? And we still I think they still have it. <laughs> right? they still they have it so yeah. so but here, here's kind of to be fair. Right. Um, what was happening was uh, we would patrol officers would go to a any kind of call or whatever we would never question anything about anyone and so if you told me you were robbed you were robbed and so we would have to what cover our ass right that's what they taught us and so because of that there was no preliminary investigation really to ask some basic questions right uh and if there's any kind of um deceit or anything we, we couldn't do anything we still had to make the report and and i think we had a system to be fair here i really do think we had a system that was too it was too easy to report a crime and then what would happen on the investigative side was it was too hard to unfound it if 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 an offense report had already been made you remember those days I, I do uh you would find that we would take a lot of reports from people that were themselves engaging in criminal activity and then had subsequently become victimized and so the investigation of was a good tool specifically to deal with that type of complaint. An investigation of, I'm not saying that it was all illegitimate, right. but what we found on the back end was that some stuff that needed to be founded then didn't get well, founded. Well, here, here's, I yeah, think, one right. of the issues, uh, if, if we can go back, is um, let's say there's four of us in this room, right? Uh, if we have a gunman come in here and take all of our wallets right now, that would be counted under that system as one crime with uh, one complainant and three witnesses. I believe that was an issue as well. So uh, again, right, we go back to this numbers thing, right? But, but my What's point was right? is that the department claimed all of that. Oh, right. Th what I'm trying, what I'm trying to say is, you say departments take too much credit. Well, they took credit for all of it, <laughs> and so now when it's the pendulum starting to swing you back, go. you know, that's why you, that's why I felt like the department needed to be more upfront with people. Yes, there's a percentage of our crime reduction, I'll, and I'll give you a perfect example. Do you remember shoplifting? Yes. And I yes. remember me and Chief Brown went round and round on this one, but the day they implemented the change in the policy, I mean, the day, and, and I was working with a reporter <laughs> named Steve Thompson, who's now with the Washington Post, who's actually good with uh, computer stuff. I'm not. But he was able to do this, like, graphic thing. And the day the policy went into place, we went from an average of 10 Class C's yeah. down to three. That ended up being somewhere between, I forget the numbers now. It was it was not an insignificant part of the crime reduction that year, but they didn't want to acknowledge it. They just didn't want to say, yeah, we changed the policy. We made it harder to report Class C. So your contention is, uh, or I don't know if it's contention, but what you're saying I is, is we should have been, uh, we sh I say we, could have been more open and forthcoming about yeah. about that reality, right? Yeah, I mean, they wanted to claim all the crime reductions on themselves. Again, that's why for me, the murder number has always been my real number because I, when I was doing crime stats investigation, basically back in the day, you know, this is probably 2012 time frame. Uh, I actually looked at murder, and I tried to catch y'all hiding some murders, and I couldn't find it. So <laughs> if it was happening, I would have reported it. Well, well, Chief Brown used to say we can't hide bodies, and and well, uh, I, it, I, there true. have been departments that have hidden <laughs> bodies Th that have tried. There have been some departments <laughs> that have gotten in trouble well, for it. So I did look. Well, well I read this uh, this pretty cool article doing some research just preparing for this um it's uh from the pew research center they have five facts about crime and and uh, i'm just going to show you that number five if you can pull it up um and, and really what it says is 43 percent of violent crimes aren't even reported guys so so when we talk about numbers right there it is right there when we talk about that only or i should say in 2018 let's say 43 percent of violent crimes were reported to the police only 43 percent 
so that's a significant mm-hmm. number, right? What's going on in our immigrant communities? They're not reporting a lot of crime. Why is that? Because we go back to the fear and the trust mm-hmm. and all those things that, 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 that we've been talking about. So uh, again, right, for me, I, I cringe sometimes when we talk about numbers because I'm not so sure we can ever be accurate with the crime reporting and, and so when, how, how do we balance all that Numbers stuff? are useless without interpretation. And I think uh, Tanya just, just made some really excellent points about that. It's uh, how you interpret the data and how you're led through the data. And I'll give you an example. Uh, in Lake Dallas, uh, my first year as the police chief, I looked at all of my, my data and I realized that we had a problem with uh, intimate partner family violence. And so we launched a program. We have uh, received a federal grant for a violence against women specialty investigator. And of course, with that comes specialty training. So our our detectives and our police officers know how to use trauma-informed techniques. So we're better interviewers. We have better literature. We've done a lot of outreach. And that first year, I think my violent crime rate in my town went up 143%. So if you don't control for that number, uh, Lake Dallas was more dangerous than Baghdad. (laughs) <laughs> right, because in, and that's where you have to keep your 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 public and your city council you in the know of. It's not suddenly that you have more crime, right? It's that you have more reporting. It's been here the whole time. These were people that were marginalized, that had no relationship with us. We had not reached out to them. We did not put them in a position where they felt that we could be responsive. And as that pendulum is swinging, that number went way up. And then, really, again, to go back to interpreting the data in year three of this grant. Uh, it should have peaked and start to go back down. My colleagues are making excellent points, um, but the the problem all of us in this room have is we know all the data sources. So the, the public doesn't understand that when you talk about the underreporting, it's using data from the BJS study, which is from the National Crime Victimization Survey, which is a survey of households about victimization. It's, it's, it's not everybody who's been victimized. And then you have the UCR data, and then you have the hierarchy rule about how you count uh, crimes by seriousness. And now a lot of departments are moving to NIBRS. When you move to NIBRS, a lot of departments are to see an increase in crime. It has nothing to do with a real incidence increase in crime. But the public doesn't understand the nuances of these things. And again, when you throw up a number, people are going to get fixated on that number. But you have to unpack what that number is and how that number gets populated. And, and you have to just, and these things aren't difficult to understand. We just have to explain to people that these are where these numbers come from. And so be, with explaining, it go back to the foundation, we have to hopefully have the confidence and the trust that we're telling them the truth. In other words, we think we're telling them the truth, but are they perceiving it as the truth? Do they have confidence in us when we say, listen, we changed our reporting system. That doesn't necessarily mean that we have less crime. We just, it looks different. And here's why, A, B, and C, right? But it goes back to that. Do you have confidence in us? And can I have this conversation with you? And the second part of that is, are we doing a good job? I say we in policing doing a good job explaining that. Could we do a better job, Tom? Well, of course. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, look, it, it, I think it's human nature when crime is going down to want to take credit. I mean, that's just human nature. And, 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 but, and, you, and then there's also this phenomena of you figure, well, I'm not going to be around when it goes back up, right? If it's, if it's kind of like headed on the downward, you know, because you can see the trend lines. Yeah. yeah. You know, because like even, even, in, even in recent years, it was really about in, 2015 where you kind of started to see it 2015 2016 because 2016 was the year I did the dying in Dallas series in 2016 2017 and part of the reason I did dying in Dallas that was a series on people dying in the city of Dallas was because I started to see that number tick back up I could see that we were starting to head back that direction because when I started covering DPD in the early 2000s y'all were averaging 230 240 a year that was not you know an unusual number and then and and so yeah i mean i think that there has to be a balance there yeah. of of not taking too much credit but there you go. but i would like I, I mean i would love to see what happens if you get the department it, the dallas police department back up to you know 3500 officers and and what kind of difference that would make because right now, right now a lot of your investigative units like i think it's aggravated assaults right now the assaults unit has 11 officers 11 detectives yeah that's just they can't handle the capacity they're just as one uh, detective told me we're just triaging we're just triaging 
And, you know, those are the most likely to lead to murders, people mm. that are committing aggravated assaults. Dr. Picaro, you had something. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great point that she made. I also think that, uh, like politics, all crime is local, and people may not care what happens in other cities, but we have to compare Dallas to other cities around the country. Uh, Dallas is still a very safe city. Uh, when yes. we compare ourselves to our colleagues that have similar sized populations, like Philadelphia would be a good barometer of that. Uh, can we do better? Yes. Uh, can we be worse? Yes. Um, but we, we can't let these numbers um, create a sense of fear where people don't want to go to the grocery store or this weekend where they went to a basketball game. They went to a high school basketball right. game. You know, these things shouldn't be happening at a high school basketball game, obviously. And so we have to, we have to, put an, uh, we have to, we have to be serious about the numbers, but we also have to have a narrative about, wait a second, where are we relative to our peers? I think, it, and that's an important benchmark to have, and it's not to give the city a free pass. It's just to put us in perspective with our colleagues. There you go. And, and I think that's important. Go ahead. So, James. so what role would you think uh, our elected leadership has in this? Because because we've we we talk about the team effort, okay? And I think there's there's and Dr. Precari, you you can jump in on this if you need to. Um, from what I've read, there's a lot of evidence that that more cops just by the sheer volume has some deterrent effect on crime. Um, and when Dallas was up to 3,700, obviously you had more, more visible police presence on the street. You had uh, better response times, things like that. But once you get your department to where you want it, right, you need help protecting it. And th this is one of the, the main issues that I've championed as a police chief is, okay, I can build you a police department. That's fine. It's, we have the skill to do this. But once we get it to where it needs to be, we need to have our elected officials who are elected by their constituents right to set their priorities in city government and the priorities have to be set with public safety or it's all going to unravel it certainly can so um re really good stuff I, I really appreciate you guys really sharing from your uh, expertise and your and and your perspectives it, it's complicated it, it is it just goes back to that i don't think it's easy as we sometimes make it seem uh you know with crime going up and down is it cyclical yes that's part of it do we need more cops yes do more cops uh, uh, you know automatically think you know mean less crime not really depends how you use them there's so depends many factors you. right uh society we, we don't know any of that but i do believe if we get everybody in the same room and i say uh back to what we were talking about people in our um nonprofits and our social service agencies and law enforcement and not just policing our sheriff's department our federal partners everybody in the same room and say let's figure this out uh, we could do a hell of a lot better all together than just us telling the public this is what we're doing and i think we're doing ourselves a disservice when we do that um so before we end we got just a couple of more minutes but dr Bicaro, you're on the mayor's task force here in dallas correct can you tell us just give us a, a, a glimpse of what uh kind of the plan that you had sure. uh, for the mayor and and this city sure uh, it was the mayor's task force on safe communities and in august the mayor charged our team about 16 people uh, with coming up with data-driven evidence-based solutions on non-law enforcement strategies that could help combat the problem of crime in the city of Dallas. And so we uh, did a lot of research, uh, academic research. We brought in speakers. We went to the communities. We uh, did ride-alongs with police officers. We scoured a whole bunch of things. And we just delivered our report uh, about 10 days ago to the mayor where we identified four specific strategies and the strategies had to begin with data-driven evidence-based solutions. The, the, everything else, you know, if you have a, a really pet program and you think it, it feels it works, it doesn't matter to me. If the evidence isn't there, it doesn't matter. The numbers, so yeah. it was all about uh, yeah. evidence. And uh, we've, yeah. we had two of them identified about fixing places and two identified about focusing on people because you can't divorce people acting in places. And so we, we brought those solutions to the mayor. The mayor had a press conference last late last week where he delivered uh, verbally um, the results of our task force recommendations. Now, of course, it's up to the city uh, to find the resources it needs uh, to put teeth into implementing this plan, whether that's through city budgets, whether through nonprofits, foundations, whoever's going to pony up for this, but to put the resources in and scale it up to the city and then keep it going forward with evaluation and fine tuning. 
you know, we can get, we can write, there's always a task force, there's always a report, there's always right. a blueprint, there's always this, always that. But if you don't follow through, we're gonna have the exact same conversation six months from now or six years from now. So I think, I think, I hope, I'm optimistic that um, the, everybody in the city of Dallas right now, the city manager, the mayor, the DA, the chief, I have got to believe they all care about the problem we have. I gotta believe that. Uh, I also gotta believe that they have the same outcome in mind. Um, can't, can't see a world where that's not, the, the case too. Now all of them need to get in a room and, and check everything at the door and say, this is what we're going to do. We're going to attack it from the policing side. We're going to attack it from the non-policing side. And that's, that's the best what you can hope for. Other cities have done it. I expect that I expect our city to do that. And I expect the leadership to do that as well. Yeah. I think we're all hopeful as well. Let's stop pointing fingers. There's no energy. I mean, what, what, why even waste energy blaming whoever, right? Uh, let, let's just fix it and, and, and do better. And I think we can do that. That's what you were talking about though, chief, as far as having the support from our elected officials. Now we have a plan, for example, in Dallas, now we need people to, to, to really get it and get ownership and support it. And, and it takes money. Takes Let's money. be real, right? It takes money. It takes money. So uh, put your money where your mouth is, right? That's right. Uh, so yep. really appreciate everything. Uh, I always like to, I'm going to end with an excellence in policing officer. Something that an officer has done in our, in our country, just to highlight the good work and the hearts of police officers. I love being a police officer. I can tell you, and you know this, and uh, our police officers love d what they do and they want to fight crime they want crime to go down too they get frustrated when they're not led or they don't know what to do they're you know they want to go out there and do good and so uh, i'm hopeful that that uh, you know with more direction they're, they're going to go out there and kick some butt there's no doubt about it so i want to show officer thomas from the detroit police department i'm sure you saw this it's just something minor but but it was caught on tape he, he saw a homeless guy and uh, needed to be shaved he was shaving and he went out there and helped him shave and i thought it was a cool story can you play that story and i observed him standing on witherill and elizabeth over here trying to use a water bottle to rinse his razor off and he had sh shaving cream on his hands his coat his face and his eyes so i had walked up and i said excuse me sir and at that point he's like okay i'll leave i'll leave i'll leave and i said no do you need some help and he turned around blindly and said yes thank you god bless Jeremy Thomas is the Detroit police officer in the heartwarming pictures Jill Mativa Schaefer took and shared on Facebook. Officer Thomas had no idea anyone was watching when he helped the man shave. The razor and shaving cream part of a handout for the homeless that a woman and her daughter had just given the man. A man Officer Thomas has seen around the ballpark. Another Comerica Park staff member said, you know, he's trying to shave in the rain. He's trying to use the downspout to rinse his face off. What he did for me, that was all right. I really appreciate that because, you know, I'm going through my thing and I'm, you know, I, I feel bad about myself, you know, but I'm going to be all right. We found 62-year-old Stanley Nelson sitting a couple of blocks away from the ballpark. God going to bless him. He, he going to bless him for doing that for me because he didn't have to do that. He got a heart, you know, and, uh, and he understand when you out here on the street, you know, look out for somebody because God will look out for you. And helping others is why Officer Thomas joined DPD three years ago. Just know that this could be you at any day. Um, I mean, like I said, nobody's better than the other person. You might be at a better position in life, but use that opportunity to you know, take care of somebody else when you can. In downtown Detroit, Kimberly Craig, 7 Action News. I, I love that, right? Nobody's better than anybody else. Some of, us, some of us are just better in life. I, I, I like that. And I, I, I like to show that, you know, I love police officers' hearts. We're, I'll say this over and over again. We're not perfect, but doggone, you're going to see that more than, than anything else. And uh, I want to show that as much as we, as much as we can. So, uh, so, again, thanks for being here, Tanya and Dr. Picaro and Chief Corolla. Uh, I enjoyed the conversation. We didn't solve the world's problems today, but perhaps we can do this again and, and maybe put another spin on it and look at crime from another angle. I'd love to have you back and continue, can, can continue this conversation. Uh, I'll end with this. Uh, don't ever forget that wearing a uniform doesn't separate you from the community it makes you more a part of it. Uh, thanks again for being here and thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next time.